I'm really sorry I'm not Rick Parfit Jr. For those of you who uh, <laughs> for dinner last night, just as Rick was starting the first power chord, that's when I left. I decided I could stay all night and this will be great, or I should go home and get some sleep. So the kind of parallel universe is spurred off at that moment. Um, there is another universe where I'm still with Rick Parfit Jr. Um, but luckily I'm here with, uh, with, with you guys. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I just need to... Uh, what did I do with the clicker? Here's the clicker. Um, it's, great to be, um, it's great to be with you. It's great to be with so many brilliant people, radiologists and radiographers and medical physicists, uh, doctors. Um, I think about my own school career when I was thinking about what I wanted to do and what I was good at when I was at school and thinking about sort of careers. I've just been giving a talk in front of lots of slightly bemused 15-year-olds. And I was thinking, what, did, what, was, what was I good at? What did I want to do at school? It was basically that. That was my kind of main uh, accomplishment when I was at school, was sort of staring out the window. But it actually, it kind of, in a way, it stood me in, in good stead. Um, I wanted, today, I want to talk a little bit about technology and the sort of genesis of technology and what technology is and, and where it comes from. You all work with extraordinary technology. You all work in this miraculous world of imaging. Um, it's an extraordinary world. Uh, I, I kind of think, well, if we'd been born a couple of hundred years ago, I suppose wherever you are in history, you think you're living in a, a world of uh, miracles. But where we are today is quite extraordinary. And I want to sort of look a, little, look a little bit of the genesis of where all that came from, but particularly in relation to space flight, which is kind of where I am. Uh, yesterday, as you know, when we were at dinner, we were talking about the, the 50th anniversary of Apollo. And it's a very important anniversary, not just historically, but also in terms of technology as well. So I'm going to touch on a little bit of, of that. Um, I'll start just from my beginnings, this was, a, this, was, uh, this was a book my dad had. This book was published in 1959. Uh, and when I was about seven years old, I used, to just, I used to just stare at the front cover of this book because I thought it was extraordinary, partly because I couldn't believe you could stand that close to a rocket. I thought the idea of being able to stand that close to a rocket was extraordinary. And of course, I was in awe of the astronaut in the silver spacesuit. I thought the, no the notion of the silver spacesuit was brilliant. And of course, one must, when I'm older, I might have a spacesuit of, uh, of my own. And there we go. Um, but I kind of thought I, maybe I'd be that little boy in the, in the trousers uh, looking at this extraordinary rocket. I was also very interested, if you look here, you can see all these little people right by the rocket looking as if they had important jobs. I didn't know quite what they did, but they looked important. And I was rather fascinated by them. Um, so cut to uh, some uh, 40 years later, there I am. That close, almost the exact distance from the rocket. Uh, and if you look at the bottom of the rocket, look, the little people, the little people are there. I was so excited because they were there. And I still didn't know what they do. I, I, I met some of them, but they all had kind of important jobs doing things that seemed important. Uh, this was actually, I was lucky enough to, I, I was working, uh, for the BBC doing Stargazing Live, and I was out there covering Tim Peake's launch. Do you know Tim Peake? Yeah, yeah, okay, fine. Uh, so that was that, that was that, that, that Soyuz rocket. Uh, look, I even did the, I, I even tried just for the, just this was what I was doing this morning when you were all having hangovers. If you look at the kind of typeface of that, hang on. Oh, I got it almost exactly right. Look, I was so pleased with it. Anyway. Um, so um, I want to talk a little bit about leaving the planet, how to leave the planet, why we leave the planet, wh what it means to leave the planet, uh, the technology it takes to leave the planet. Uh, this is the planet I'm talking about. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. That's planet Earth. Uh, as of breakfast this morning, the population of planet Earth was that. This was the United Nations kind of world population clock that ticks around. So seven and, seven and a half billion, over seven and a half billion people uh, living and working on spaceship Earth, and we sort of we we kind of just about managed just about managed to do that. Population in space, living and working and doing science as of today, is six. If you're interested in, in where I got that number from, if you pull out your iPhone, uh, there is an app, uh, and the app is called How many people are there in space right now? And you press the app, How many people are in space right now? And then little number six. There you go. So that's how that works. Miracu it is miraculous. The fact that I can just pull that out of my pocket and give you that fact is, is, 
I would be burnt as a witch if this was the 1600s. This would be extraordinary. So six people living and working, scientists on board the International Space Station doing extraordinary experiments, medical experiments, uh, psychological experiments, material science, uh, all kinds of different things, uh, which has now been permanently crewed now for, gosh, like 18 years now, is it? The International Space Station? It's, it's, a, it's a modern miracle. Uh, let's have another number for you. Let's have a look. To oh, this is a good one. Total number of people who have left the planet. So by leaving the planet, anything over 100 kilometers, if you can go 100 kilometers straight up, we get to what we call the Kármán line, which is named after the physicist, the Hungarian physicist, Theodor von Kármán. It's 100 kilometers, and that's kind of where aeronautics ends, if you like, and astronautics begins. So it's the sort of limits of the wing of an aircraft. Anyone, give me a number, what do you think? Since 61, since Gagarin in 61, Come on, I know you're all slightly asleep. It's a gentle talk, this. I'm not going to demand too much of you, so. 300, 300 what was it? Someone said 500. 500. You're very close. 571. I might give you a little prize, actually. <laughs> Shall I give you a prize? The prize is my respect. <laughs> Which money can't, well, it can buy, actually. <laughs> And I am, so I'm here, so there we go. Um, actually, I'll tell you what, I tell, I'm going to, because it's rare to have such, to do this in, in such a group of such esteemed uh, academics and scientists and brilliant people. Um, of course, when we think about being an astronaut, we automatically think of the right stuff, the famous Tom Wolfe novel and film, which sort of chronicled that early journey of the, the Mercury astronauts, those who wore the silver spacesuits in the late 50s and early 60s, before we went to Apollo. So what I've done is I've downloaded for you uh, this is the official NASA application form, all right? So we're going to go through it line by line. And if everyone stands up, the last person standing will win. Are you ready for this? Not my respect. You will win the chance to go into space. I kid you not. And a book, my book. So if we have a little bit of house lights, please, James. If we're, I'm going to do a little experiment to see who amongst you would... If you were applying to be an astronaut today, so if everyone stands up, I know you're, and this is the end of the audience participating, then we'll crack on, we'll do a little bit of science. Right, so, okay. All of you, it'd be really, this is actually going to be quite interesting because I think many of you would actually qualify. Um, so sit down if you don't have this. If you don't have a bachelor's degree in engineering, biological science, physical science, computer science, or mathematics, can everyone stand? <laughs> that's, that's genius. Okay, the Soyuz only sits three. So basically, I need three people. OK, the next one is, do you have at least three years of related professional experience or 1,000 hours of pilot's in-command time in a jet aircraft? So basically, have you had a job for three years? I think that's what it means. I'm not entirely sure. It's, it's kind of, or how am I going to do this? Because there's, <laughs> I've only got one copy of my book. Uh, okay. All right, let's see the next one. Okay, you need to have 2020 vision. But, ha but hang on, wait, wait, wait. It can be correctable. So if. Hooray! So, like myself, if I could be bothered, I could go and get la lasered. But I'm not going to get lasered. I could do, maybe I could do it with a laser on here. Um, John Young, of course, you'll all remember John Young, Apollo 14. He also commanded STS-1, landed the shuttle wearing glasses, so... The, okay. All right. Blood pressure, not exceeding 140 over 90, measured in a seating position. Come on! <laughs> oh, this is going really bad. Normally, by this, we've got, like, two. Never do this as an oncology conference. It's like, this is a, such a stupid idea. Uh, height, it's in, in American, between 62. What's that, like, five... One to six, one or something? Come on, Heather, what's that in, in old money? Five, two to six, three. So if you're between five, two to six, three, <laughs> remain standing. Okay. It's going to get tougher. So this is the kind of, it's going to get tougher. Okay, uh, official scuba qualification. Oh. You will need minimum paddy open water. Do you have your paddy open water? Does anyone have anything more advanced than paddy open water? What do you have? The what? That's just showing off. 
You have advanced. Okay, we've got, so how many have we got? We've got one, two, oh, three. We've got, okay. What's next? Uh, treading water continuously for 10 minutes wearing a flight suit. Well, you've all got your paddy, so you can all do that. Uh, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, come on, do I have one person standing? Are you, are you at the back, are you standing because... Anyone, do I not have one person? Yes, you win the prize. A round of applause. What's your name? Say again? Karis. You, you could apply to the, for the astronaut corps and you would not be turfed out. I mean, I don't, you've won, this is it, I kid you not, I said you were gonna win the chance to go into space. I have these connections. Um, this is the actual astronaut candidate application form, which I just downloaded off the NASA website. So that is the chance to go into space. So fill it out, <laughs> send it off to the Johnson Space Center, and there you go. And you get a free copy, and you get a copy of my, a copy of my, um, <clears throat> a copy of my book <clears throat> available on Amazon at the moment. The, actually, the algorithm, the Amazon algorithm gods have been kind. It's now, I think it's half price. Uh, okay. Right, I want to talk a little bit about technology. I want to talk about this. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about information. This was a, a schematic that was done by a gentleman called Ron Jones in 1980, just after the, the shuttle disaster. Ron Jones uh, worked for uh, uh, Rockwell, which was an engineering company, and he after the shuttle disaster, he kind of wondered in the early 1980s, what would it take for human beings to actually become a multi-planetary species? You know, we, we'd been to the moon by that point, we've got the space shuttle, but if we wanted to really branch out, if we wanted to really sort of colonize other planets and, and explore the cosmos, what would we need to do in terms of technology? And what he did was he printed, he made this little flow chart, it's a beautiful piece of information. And it starts off, down this side, you've got dates. So it starts off as sort of 1980. And it goes down to the year 2100. And if you follow these wonderful lines, each little box contains a bit of technology that we would need to accomplish, or a thing that we would need to do, or a problem that we would need to overcome, or something that we would need to solve. And all these lines of information became beautifully interwoven in this kind of like a tapestry. Imagine making a rug that's just full of information. I'm going to zoom in. You can actually print, if you print the whole thing out, it's about the height of this kind of roof all the way down. And you can just get lost down these rabbit holes of, of thinking about really how the human mind works when it comes to uh, solving problems. Let's zoom in a little bit so we can see. So this is where we are. So this, was 20, this is 2018, so 2019. This is where Ron Jones thought we should be by now. So we've got things like, Martian cycling spaceship launch. Human expansion into the inner solar system begins. Tri-planetary Earth, Moon, Mars infrastructure enabled. And you can see, if you kind of follow these lines, all the things we need to do, fiber optic cable manufacturing, uh, HE3 export, helium-3 export, all this kind of slightly esoteric stuff. And of course, we're not there yet. We haven't done any of this stuff. We thought about it a lot. If we kind of go into the far future, let's go right to the end, to 2100, um, we get to things like human expansion into the cosmos begins. Um, independent spacefaring human communities. And right at the bottom, this is my favorite bit, the very, very last word, ad astra. It means to the stars. Um, and it's a wonderful way of displaying information and thinking about information in, in a logical way. And it was the first kind of real proper infographic that, that anyone had ever really, really done and circulated and, and made popular. Um, but I want to really talk about this. Of course, this year, as you know, uh, and the theme of this conference and the theme of the dinner last night was celebrating the Apollo 11th, 50th anniversary. Um, it began at the beginning of the 1960s. We think of it the end of the 1960s, 1969, but it actually began really in 1961. The kind of genesis of Apollo began when Kennedy made his famous speech at Rice Stadium, Rice University, uh, in 1961. Of course, you, know, you all know the speech. It's the we choose to go to the moon speech. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon not because it's easy, but because it's hard, because that goal 
will serve to measure the best of our abilities and skills. And it's an extraordinary piece of rhetoric. It was written by a guy called Ted Sorensen. And if you kind of work your way through the speech, there's the famous bit that I just mentioned, but there's other bits. Of course, Kennedy says at the time, this will be the most hazardous, the most dangerous, and the greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. And he was absolutely correct. Nobody had tried anything audacious like this before. This is my favorite little paragraph from that speech. And I think it's really important for you guys who work in technology. We shall send to the moon a giant rocket made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, fitted together with the precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food and survival on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, and do it right, and do it first, before the decade is out. Then we must be bold. I think the legacy, if you wanted a legacy of Apollo, it's that. Then we must be bold. Being bold is what it's all about. We can put our minds to things. They hadn't even invented the... Uh, pretty much anything that kind of went on Apollo. I want to start at the beginning. So let's just talk very briefly about this. So this wasn't invented in 1961. Uh, the alloys, the metals, particularly things like the F1 engines uh, that were bolted to the bottom of this. This is, of course, the Saturn V rocket. Uh, still to this day, the most powerful rocket ever imagined, ever designed, built by Dr. Werner von Braun, a captured Nazi scientist after the Second World War who was spirited away to America in order to develop the technology that would get us to the moon. It's an extraordinary bit of engineering. But it didn't just come from nowhere. This is what I was trying to talk to the 15-year-olds today about. Things like iPhones and rockets don't just come from anywhere. They, they have a, a genesis. And I've been actually, the last kind of year, thinking about the real early ideas behind things like rockets. Where do they come from? This was... <laughs> I love this. This is as early as I could go back. This is 14th century. This is a 14th century um, rocket cat and rocket pigeon, <laughs> which I completely fell in love with. I'm like, yeah, of course. They, people sort of had the right idea back then. They didn't quite have the, they didn't have the sort of rocket equation yet, but they, they had the, 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 the imagination uh, to do it. If we just go forward a couple of hundred years, 1648. This was, there was an English bishop, uh, Francis Godwin. Uh, and Francis Godwin wrote this story, The Man in the Moon, about, he imagined, a, 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 it was a, a Spanish traveler called uh, Domingo Gonzalez. And he imagined, Godwin imagined, well, if you could get some geese, and he, he imagined these geese called ganza that migrated between the earth to the moon, and if you could somehow capture them and tie them to a little seat, then you could go up to the moon. And that's kind of how he imagined doing it. In fact, it was this. If anyone's read James and the Giant Peach, have you read James and the Giant Peach? Of course you have. Uh, this is where Roald Dahl got his idea from uh, for, for capturing the, the seagulls that took the peach away to New York. So that's that. Now, a bit forward. This is, this is very good. So a lot of you will know this. Jules Verne, of course, uh, late 19th century. Jules Verne, the great science fiction writer, um, imagined this great lunar adventure. And the way that he thought, the technology that he imagined getting to the moon would be this. You've got this giant cannon. Now, the idea would be you'd put your three astronauts in here in a kind of ballistic shell, and then you would just have one huge explosion that would propel the astronauts to the moon some quarter of a million miles away. Uh, and uh, this is a very famous picture from the Georges Méliès film, um, uh, based on, and, and that was the idea. But of course, the physicists amongst you would know that it's not going to work. The, the amount of energy, the force you would need to propel a, a capsule from the Earth to the Moon would be so great uh, that any astronauts on board inside that would, would be squashed. Um, and so we had to come up with something a little bit different. But the Jules Verne story is interesting because what it did was it inspired a group of mathematicians and physicists at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, people like uh, Tsiolkovsky in Russia, Robert Goddard in America, uh, Hermann Obert um, in Germany in the 1920s, and of course Werner von Braun, who were all obsessed by this idea of Jules Verne's journey to the moon. Could it be possible? How would we do it? And eventually, the kind of mathematics and the engineering came together, and it kind of, they, they kind of worked it out. It, it, it's, it's a really simple thing, actually. The, the kind of maths, I, I was doing this with the kids. I might actually show you, because it's quite fun. Um, you all know what these are, don't you? Old people. Film, Film canister, exactly. 
you're not old. I'm just, but you're, you're just knowledgeable. 35 mil film camera makes very, very good rocket filled with a little bit of um, uh, very uh, volatile uh, rocket fuel known as water. <coughs> and one of these. I opened this up in front of the 15, and I said, do you know what this is? Said, yeah, it's a condom. I'm like, no, it's not. It's a condom. It's an Alka-Seltzer. This is, this is the, the, the minds of 15-year-old boys. Anyway. So I'm just going to, this is, this is what um, Bishop Francis Godwin hadn't really figured out, but we're going we're gonna to do it for you just, just because um, Alka-Seltzer, for those of you who had a late night last night, I have some. Um, of course, what we do is we put the Alka-Seltzer in the water, and it's going to fizz. It's going to give off um, carbon dioxide. And because we're putting it in a sort of a closed container, see, that's bubbling away nicely. If we shut the lid on, give it a bit of a shake, turn it upside down, pressure builds up. Yeah? Carbon dioxide has nowhere to go. Every action has an equal and opposite. Every action, A! There you go. That's what, um, that's what Jules Verne didn't realize. He thought it, he didn't realize that you, you could actually, in a vacuum, you could build rockets, and, and he didn't realize that. But I'm going to show you, I, I was, I'm going to show you the, what a real rocket looks like, kind of scaled up, because um, they're pretty impressive. This is uh, just before Tim's launch. Uh, this is at the Baikonur Cosmodrome a couple of years ago. So let's have a little, little look at this. It's Saturday, December 12th. Bit more volume. Getting its final checks on the production line today Bit more volume. is the Thank rocket you. that will launch Tim into space, Soyuz TMA-19M. What makes that so extraordinary is not just that it ferries people into space, but that it does it on such a regular basis. It is so reliable, so elegantly designed that other rockets have come and gone over the years, but Soyuz keeps on going. This is the 128th Soyuz flight. They make a new one for every mission. Building this way is relatively cheap and efficient, unlike the space shuttle that required costly maintenance after every trip. So this is the real muscle. This is the business end, the stage one boosters and the stage two central core, which all fire and lift off, just like a sprinter leaving the box to give you maximum power right at the beginning. When Sergei Korolov first envisioned this over half a century ago, he had no idea that his design would become the workhorse of space travel. But essentially, it is the same 1950s design as the R-7 intercontinental ballistic missile that went on to launch Sputnik and the first people in space. Simple engineering that has stood the test of time. The next day, Tim's rocket is ready to roll. It's 6.30 in the morning, it's bitterly cold. They've just opened the doors of the vehicle assembly hangar and they've backed in this diesel engine which, they, which they're going to attach to the Soyuz rocket itself. And then they're going to drag it out on its journey down that way towards the launch pad. Here she comes. What a glorious sight, Soyuz, queen of the skies. That is proper engineering. Two hours later, it arrives here at the historic Gagarin start launch pad. So look at this, the train is now moving away, leaving the rocket there, and it's about to go up into its vertical position. That's, um, well, that's actually the really important bit, the bit, you know, forget about the, you know, liquid oxygen, it's actually the holy water that makes the rocket go really fast. Um, it's a really interesting fact that, we, you know, when you're at a, a, a launch at Baikonur, so wrapped up is the idea of space flight, wrapped up in our culture, in our literature, uh, in our poetry, in our ideas. Every launch, every human launch flight begins, with the, the Russian priest goes into the flame trench underneath the rocket and performs mass. And then he comes up and everyone receives a blessing with the holy water. It's a really, it's a beautiful thing. There is something very symbolic and uh, extraordinary about it. Um, has anyone been to a launch? 
One, two, a couple of, uh, Shuttle or Baikonur? Shuttle, okay. So that picture from my dad's book, keep that in your mind for a moment, all right? So we, that picture, the kids and the astronaut, they were about, I don't know, 50 feet from the, rock, from the, from the rocket. This was uh, the picture that we took of the launch, which is an extraordinary image. The only way we could take that image so close with our camera position was if we pretended, and we did, we pretended we were from Top Gear. <laughs> and, and I kid you not, I pretended I was Richard Hammond. <laughs> because I, the guard was like, who are you? And we're like, BBC. It's like, oh, BBC is Top Gear. And we were like, yes, my name's Richard Hammond. Oh, come, come, come. So we were suddenly, um, we were suddenly whisked underneath the barrier and, and, um, and uh, we put the camera there. I mean, I mean, you can see how close we are. For those of you who've been to a shuttle launch in America, you know, you're miles away. In, in Kazakhstan, you're like, there are, as, as long as you don't break rocket, please, wherever. <laughs> so we were really close and we didn't know quite how close we should go. But what we wanted to do is capture not just the, the visuals, beautiful images like that, but the sound. Because all that energy that is, is emitted in sound, and it's a beautiful sound. It's a loud sound. It, but it's not just a loud, it, it, the, the earth moves, literally, um, and it's stupendous. So my friend James at the back, who's on the, are you ready for this, James? Great. What we're going to do is I'm going to show you, you may require fingers and ears, but this is what a rocket sounds like from about 50 feet. And it's, listen to all the stages, listen to the sound of the fuel injectors, listen to the rumble as the, the engines catch, listen to the moment when it is released into the sky and see if you can just uh, imagine yourself being there. Ready? It's beautiful. It's like listening to bark or something. It has that same kind of resonance. It's 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 uh, it's great. Anyway, how was that? I was, was it the, yeah. Did you get the? Did you get it? Okay, good. Um, so that's rockets. Of course, those of you who are planning on leaving the planet, uh, if you're interested, we we got a new one in town. This is the Virgin Galactic. Very very quickly, um, this was a test flight a couple of months ago um, of uh, Richard Branson's. Uh, space plane, it's not like an orbital rocket like Soyuz or, or Apollo, but it's a space plane. It crosses the Kármán line and does a big sort of parabolic, par parabolic kind of loop, and you, you're sort of weightless here, and then it sort of glides back down to Earth. This is what it looks like in the cockpit. It's about $250,000 a ticket, if anyone here is very wealthy. Um, this is the kind of view from the window. Well, not even the view, but this is a, a lady called Beth, uh, Beth Moses. Beth works for Virgin Galactic, and this was her first trip. Uh, and she was kind of in charge of looking after the passengers on board, and she was up there just to check out the space. And I love that picture. Uh, when astronauts are in space and they look back at the Earth, they have this kind of cognitive shift, which we call the overview effect. It's this idea of suddenly seeing the Earth from above, um, and that does something to us. When we see the Earth in context in the, in the, in the ocean of space, suddenly, wow, this is, it's a new way of seeing the Earth. And this is Beth um, having exactly that moment. In fact, there's, um, that's exactly what she saw. That's, that's the view from the about 100 kilometers up. You can see the, the limb of the Earth here and just how thin that atmosphere is. It's an amazing shot. Um, Blue Origin, um, Jeff Bezos, who's the, who's the CEO of Amazon. They, they sell books, books like my book. Um, oh, um, he's... He's, uh, he has his own space program. Of course, we're at this point now where technology, like the internet, has enabled people to become so wealthy that they can have their own space programs now. We don't need governments anymore. People like Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson and Elon Musk, uh, we can do it themselves thanks to this extraordinary new technology. For the engineers amongst you, this is how it works. Uh, 
This is the kind of flight profile. So rather than a plane, you've got your standard booster here. And then this is the capsule where the astronaut sits, which separates here. Way you go above the Kármán line, 100 kilometers. That's your kind of parabola. That's when you're in uh, your sort of microgravity environment, if you like, in free fall. And then you parachute back down to Earth, where they give you a copy of my book. They don't, sorry, I've got to shut up about the books. Come on, stop. Um, funnily enough, actually, if you look at that, this was actually exact, almost exactly the same bit of technology, but from 1947. Um, some British scientists captured a, a Nazi V2 missile, and they had exactly the same idea. Uh, and I found this the other day, the British Interplanetary Society. I'm like, look at that. It's exactly the same. It separates, and they go above, and then they parachute back down to Earth. So um, we've been thinking about these ideas for a long time. Uh, I always say the imagination is built for space travel, the human body less so. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult. The, just going back to Apollo, the thing that we think of Apollo, we think of the space race, we think of this technological uh, race between the Americans and the Soviet Union, and we, we often think it was to do with rockets. It, was, it really wasn't to do with rockets. It was really to do with navigation. The reason that the Americans beat the Russians was because of what we what was known as the Apollo guidance computer. Of course, we didn't have computers like we have computers now. Computers didn't exist. There were no digital computers. The real uh, miracle, if you like, of Apollo was to take computers that were the size of rooms and actually squash them down uh, in a way that they would fit inside a space capsule because we'd need computers in order to, uh, for the rocket to perform various functions, not least navigation, uh, flags and spacesuits. Uh, when we think about Apollo, and we think particularly about Apollo 11, uh, we, we think about probably this image. This is one of the most famous images here. You have Buzz Aldrin standing by the flag, saluting the flag. This flag is one of my favorite stories in all of the Apollo stories. Apollo, by today's money, you're talking $100 billion. The flag itself was still something that had to be engineered. There was a problem. How do we put a flag up in, on the moon? How are we going to build it? How are we going to design it? This flagpole was designed and made by a guy called Jack Kinsler uh, only about a month before the, the mission left. They didn't know they were going to put a flag up. It was a sort of last minute idea. So they went to Jack Kinsler, who was an engineer, you know, a bit of an odd job man there who did bits and pieces. And he, this is the, his exact sketch that he did. He bought some aluminum tubing, uh, which cost about $80. Uh, he hemmed the flag itself and slipped it through this pole. So you've got a pivot here, a small hinge. So it folds up, and then you lift it above 90 degrees, and then it catches, and that holds the flag in place. Um, this is my favorite bit. If you look just here, that number is very important. 550, 550, $5.50, in fact. That's how much the flag cost. Jack sent his secretary out on, on her lunch break uh, and said, oh, we need to get a flag. So she went to Sears department store and bought a flag, and that's it. That's the one that's on the moon. Um, there was. <laughs> It was one of those kind of simple ideas that needed a little bit of planning, uh, but there you go. But this is the most famous picture um, of all the thousands and thousands of images that were taken during Project Apollo. Um, this is, of course, Buzz Aldrin in what is the A7L lunar excursion suit. This suit was designed and made by a company uh, called ILC Dover, uh, formerly known as Playtex. Playtex who made women's structured underwear bras and girdles and this kind of stuff, and of course, NASA were like, well, these are the perfect people to make a, a spacesuit, something that's strong and flexible and uses lots of different materials that astronauts can move in. If you're interested, Buzz Aldrin, the, he's standing like that with his arm cocked uh, because he's not sort of looking at the camera. He's actually looking at the wrist because written on his, the sleeve of his glove was his checklist of what to do. So one, plant flag, two, pick up rocks. Uh, it was all written down there because they weren't actually on the surface of the moon for very long. But I love this picture. And if you look very closely in the visor, you can see Neil Armstrong in his AL7 suit, which we have right here. Um, let's look a little bit closer. These are, I, was, I was lucky enough to work with these suits uh, and take some imaging, do some pictures of them, because I wanted to understand how they worked better. And actually, I was as much in awe of the stitching work, the women, the women who stitched these suits, each one of these stitches, if we zoom in, zoom in a little bit further, you can see, you can start to see the nap of the fabric, how the fabric works. Each one of those stitches was measured uh, by hand, uh, and it's the most beautiful bit of craft, the most beautiful bit of engineering. Let's look a little bit closer, actually, then we can really zoom in. 
you can really start to understand how the fabric of those suits work. That white is called beta cloth. It's a, a sort of glass fiber fabric that was woven together. And again, as in Kennedy's speech, this stuff didn't, it didn't exist before. The materials that made up these suits, Kapton, neoprene, all these different kinds of rubbers and aluminiums didn't really exist at this time, but they're beautiful. I went a little bit closer as well. There we go. For the imaging people amongst you. Um, here you can see how the fabrics have kind of uh, stood up the test of time over 50 years. All these little kind of lumps in here are bits of moon dust that are actually kind of embedded within the fabric. Um, the suits are in pretty bad condition at the moment, but um, I really like this image. I think it's a really beautiful way. And a bit like the Apollo guidance computer and a little bit like the Ron Jones schematic, all these fibers coming together loaded with ideas and possibility. Um, for those of you who are planning on leaving the planet, spacesuits, flags, rockets. The other thing you're going to need is uh, food. Um, it, it often gets overlooked when we talk about engineering and, and science. This was some of the Apollo food that the astronauts used. You know, going to the moon, it's, in, in terms of a time frame, it's only th three days to the moon, three days back, and however long you're on the moon. So you're kind of done and dusted in 10 days. And anyone who's been on a 10-day camping trip knows you can get by on pretty meager rations. Um, when you're in space for longer, six months or a year, then food takes on a very important psychological component. Um, like, for example, this is the bacon sandwich Apollo style. Um, as you can see, it's pretty basic and, and, and not that tasty. Um, I'm going to... Oh, actually, should I... Very, oh, I won't do that story, otherwise we'll be here all day. Um, oh, I will do this story. Yeah, John Young and Gus Grisham, a couple of astronauts, a Gemini mission, so the missions before Apollo... Um, John Young, he, he went to Wolfie's Diner in Cocoa Beach in Florida, like a couple of days before his mission, and he bought a corned beef and mustard and mayonnaise sandwich, yeah? And he put it in the leg pocket of his flight suit and forgot about it. And then he launched, and they were in space, and then he, and then he got, oh he, said, oh, he found a sandwich, and so he pulled that sandwich out, and then NASA got, mission control went crazy, because they're like, what do, you, what do you mean you've got a corned beef sandwich? He's like, yeah, I, got, I found it, I forgot to eat it, and it was in my leg pocket. And that, I, I have the transcript of that conversation in my book, if you're interested. Um, but it's, a, it's, one of the great, it's one of the great conversations, because no one was quite sure, like, will the corned beef sandwich destroy the mission? Nobody will knew. Um, but things like crumbs, things like mayonnaise in space, interesting things happen. So, of course, engineers have to design food that's much better suited to space. Uh, Peggy Whitston here on board the ISS, this is the, the sort of current level of space sandwich. Of course, they use the flat tortilla bed. It's structurally more better than, than bread because it doesn't make crumbs, so that's kind of what they eat. Um, Tim worked with Heston Blumenthal. It's all got very chef-y now uh, in space. You know, they work with chefs. They have what's known as bonus food, where astronauts will have a particular food they like. Uh, Tim's favorite food that he wanted was, bizarrely, a bacon sandwich. So Heston was tasked with this idea of creating a bacon sandwich that would be flight ready, uh, and, you know, and would be light enough and would not make crumbs, etc. And I, I love, this was the Daily Mirror's TV chef Heston creates bacon costing a couple of million pounds. So, I mean, space flights are expensive. Even the bacon sandwiches, we're talking a couple of million quid. Um, I'm very lucky, actually, because um, I've got one. This, is a, this has been up into space. This is one of, um, this is one of uh, Tim's bacon. C hold your hand out. Come a bit closer, because it's, if you, um, you can sort of, if you just hold it, you can feel how light the can is. It's just an aluminium can. And if you just, if you give it a shake, you can sort of feel the bacon sandwich inside. Just give it a, that's two million quid. G gentle, gentle, gentle. <laughs> Otherwise known as my pension. <laughs> hey, sorry, there we go. Two million pound bacon sandwich. That makes me very, very happy. So there we go. Uh, you can come and have a little look at, uh, little look at that as well. Uh, there we go. There was Tim with his bacon sandwich all dressed up. Um, what to pack? Just very quickly, I, I mentioned the, uh, the A7L spacesuit earlier on. I just want to go back for the engineers amongst you. This is really interesting. This was the very first spacesuit, Wiley Post, 1933. Wiley Post, who was an American aviator, had this brilliant idea of, like, if I could fly into the newly discovered jet stream up there in the stratosphere, these great ribbons of fast-moving air that fly around us, I could beat all kinds of aviation records. But, of course, he knew that the air was very thin, the air pressure was very thin, 
Uh, so he made himself a spacesuit just from scratch with a guy called Russell Coley, who was, a, again, bizarrely a women's fashion designer. And all that, all it is, and also the suit here inside, is what we call a rubber bladder. It's basically a balloon um, which you wear. It's a bit like wearing a, a sort of bicycle inner tube. The main problem you have for the engineers in designing like a spacesuit that works is that if I've got a balloon like this and I pump air into it to, to put air pressure into it, um, it expands, but something else happens. So let me just see if I can do this for you. All the 15-year-old boys this morning were in hysterics when I did this. I can't imagine why. So your spacesuit <coughs> suddenly becomes bigger it expands, but it also becomes rigid. And this was one of the great engineering problems when they were designing suits to go into space. Because the thing is, that's all very well, but if I bend it, the internal volume starts to kink. If that was my arm, it starts to kink. So um, what they did was, oh, 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 they thing. Hang on. Talk amongst yourselves. Um, what they did was, this is, um, an early engineering schematic, just so you can see a little bit of how it works. These things here are called convolutes. And actually, Russell Coley, he was looking at a caterpillar crawling across a, a twig, and he noticed how a caterpillar could bend its body whilst maintaining uh, the internal volume. And um, that's kind of how a spacesuit, if we look a bit closer. Now, this is one of the early Apollo spacesuits when we we're thinking about what it would take to walk on the moon, to design a suit for humans to walk on the moon. And they actually came up with this kind of, like a tin can that you would wear. Uh, and then, of course, you've got, the, just here, you can see the kind of convolutes that would allow you to actually pressurize the suit uh, and actually um, move around in it. Funnily enough, they, they did build it. This is what it was like. <laughs> this was the very first kind of idea um, of the Apollo spacesuit. But I love this picture because, it, again, it's this idea things don't just come from nowhere. You don't just get space, nothing to fully functioning spacesuit. There is a process, as you know, um, of starting with prototypes and ideas and testing this hypothesis and this idea and, and then putting things together. Uh, and this is a wonderful reminder of how kind of science and technology works. Things don't work first time around. Make a dog for me. Come on. See if you can do a dog. Can a dog. Really? OK, there you go. You don't have to make a dog. OK. <clears throat> but this was, the final, this was the final idea. So the picture on the left, the gray picture, this is what is underneath here, the actual pressure bladder inside the suit. And you can see as it inflates, you've got cabling which stops it expanding too much. Um, you've got these wonderful convolutes here in the arms and the gloves. Here are the hoses that actually inflate the suit. And then the white, this beta cloth here, is just there to protect um, everything underneath. So it protects it from heat and, and abrasion and micrometeoroids and, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, I always think a bit like the flag and a bit like the bacon sandwich. It's one of these areas of technology that goes uh, slightly overlooked. The women who worked at Playtex were such an in incredible, integral part of the Apollo race to the moon and have largely been forgotten. Um, and that's really sad. And when I was actually there, when I was at ILC Dover working on some of the suits, we actually said, do you have any, are any of the women still alive? I, 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 and of course they're not. They've all, sadly, none of them are, are still here. But the guy gave me a bit of 16 millimeter footage uh, which we got transferred. And I want to share it to you because it's a, it's a wonderful piece of social history. And it's a wonderful, the, the kind of narration behind it is a really good reminder of how science works and how tech works. Um, and it's in this wonderful 1960s style. It's a couple of minutes and then I think we'll probably call it a day. But have a little look at this. It is an ordinary man that will make this extraordinary journey and ordinary men will make it possible. They're making him a suit for strolling out on the moon, something special, cut not from fine woolens, but from the best grade aluminum, the latest style in neoprene rubber, elastic web, plastic tubing, nylon, cheesecloth. Six layers in all, with pockets uh, extra big for picking up moonstones. This is number 11. That's that long. Number 11? 
Yeah. And this is number 11. I know, but number 11 was supposed to be that such a... I mean, that's what I got fooled the other day on that. But did you ever try to put them either flat and around together and did one a little shorter than the other? No, these were supposed to be the same size. Now, I haven't measured them. Now, just for the heck of it, let's get a hold of it. Hold that there. Yeah, but try it on this side up. What difference is it going to make? Well, this is flat. And here too, the months and years of planning, testing, experimenting, accepting this concept of design, rejecting that hypothesis, here too, the long labor comes down to something you can touch. Something which can be glued and sewed and taped. After you go down a couple of inches, Take this here and check back, and then you'll know whether you're too close to the edge or if you have to push out a little bit. Monday morning, we'll start right away on seat number 14. humans who planned and built all this and it is an ordinary human who will take the trip and the men who test the suit know the whole catalog of names for what happens to an ordinary human if a suit leaks hypoxia dysparism irradiation anoxia blackout red out ebulism this is a trip of 239,000 miles into space. But only five miles out, there's not enough air for a man to breathe. Only nine miles out, gas bubbles form in the tissues of a man's body. Only 12 miles out, a man's very blood boils away in the low pressure of space. And it is the suit which will protect him from all of that. And so the suit is tested and retested and retested. Oh, I love that bit of film so much. I love it because it's, you know, what's the key word in that film? Ordinary humans. Ordinary humans doing extraordinary things. Um, it makes me really, it makes me really happy. When you see, you know, all the Apollo 50 footage you're going to see next month on the television news, when you see that picture of Buzz Aldrin standing on the moon, remember the, the bra makers of Playtex who stitched it and, and made it all happen. Um, this is a, very quickly, this is um, on board the International Space Station. This is Andreas Morgensen, a, a Danish astronaut. He's actually wearing a different kind of space suit. This is, for the doctors amongst you, this is called a gravity countermeasure suit. It's full of kind of bungee cords, which kind of squish the body together. One of the things about working in microgravity is that, of course, things like bone density, things like muscle loss, macular degeneration, all these kind of physiological effects. Uh, engineers and scientists are working to try and mitigate these. And this is a suit that's designed to try and keep the body a little bit healthier in space. This is my favorite spacesuit. Um, spacesuits for dogs. For those of you who are planning on leaving the planet and want to take their dog, sure, we do dog spacesuits. That is um, a Russian dog spacesuit from the early 1960s. Actually, no, my all-time favorite spacesuit is this one. <laughs> this is, uh, take nothing home away from this talk but this. This cat was the only cat to have gone into space. 1961, the cat was called Felicette, and she went to space on board a French sounding rocket and lived and was actually fine. And she went with this rat, her boyfriend, I think, I don't know, I didn't check, but um, Hector, Hector the rat. In fact, Hector was the backup rat because the first rat was fired because it ate through all the cables. And so they had to get another rat. So anyway, um, forgotten space story for you. Felicet and Hector. Um, ordinary people, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. This is, um, was taken a couple of weeks ago, actually. This is the, the last of the remaining Apollo astronauts. So Project Apollo... 1968 to 1972, 24 American men flew to the moon. 12 of them set foot on the moon. And these are the ones that are still with us here. I've been lucky enough to, to, to meet a few of them. Uh, and they are, they, are they are extraordinary men, but they're also ordinary men. 
um, as we are all ordinary people who get to do extraordinary things. Um, and then when you ask them about Apollo and say, well, what was the kind of, for you, what was the most important thing of Apollo? Without a shadow of a doubt, they all say that. You know, these are, this was a time when we went to the moon to explore and test ourselves, to measure the best of our abilities and skills. And in doing so, we got this fantastic view of ourselves. This is the Apollo 17 uh, uh, shot, which we call the blue marble. Uh, and it's this moment, again, of the overview effect, where we can take a moment to step back and look at ourselves. And of course, that great sense of adventure. But a man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? And I think that's the, my take, in fact. When we do anything in science and technology, it's, like, it's that quest to grasp for what's just out of reach, uh, and that joy when we manage to um, actually get hold of it. I'm going to say thank you very much. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to sort of talk to you today. Uh, do you want to do questions? Have anyone got any questions? We'll do questions, but thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.